Hello, everybody. I'm so excited to say welcome back to the second season of Art of Activism. Uh, thank you, Mural Arts, for bringing us back uh, to have all these great discussions and chats. And this is our first episode of the second season, and we have two amazing guests with us. I have Noah Kane Smalls, uh, a curator that I've had the pleasure of working with, and Danny Simmons, who I know as the founder of Rush Arts Philadelphia, an emerging space. And actually, it isn't emerging because you came here from Brooklyn and brought it to Philly, but it's a place that fosters and cares for emerging artists. So I'm going to let them introduce themselves and tell you a bit about what they do, and we're going to get this started. Hi, everybody. You're still muted, Danny. Boom, how's that? There you go, you're on. There you go. Hey, what's up, Noah? I can see you. How you doing, good brother? It's good to see you, man. <laughs> yeah, well, I talk to you all the time, but seeing you is okay. That's a nice background. It looks like you're nice someplace. That's a, <laughs> I was just about to say that Noah with his ever-changing backgrounds. You professional people with your backgrounds and whatnot. Mm -hmm. You just zoom too much and we got to be creative about it to keep it fresh. This is the this is the Isabella Stewart Gardner Museum's uh, courtyard behind me in Boston, Massachusetts. Are you taking this moment to there. have a teachable lesson? Is that what this is? Uh -huh. And that must <laughs> be in the spring, I take it, because right now we got snow here in Philly. It's indoors. It's indoors. So it might actually be like this now. OK, oh, wow. but I'm not there. This is just. Uh, uh, you know, we, we take these moments to find relevance in any way we can as artists, you know what I mean, Ginger, as curators, you know what I'm saying, Danny. All right, so let's get this happen, I guess. Yes, yes, you know what, tell people what you do, please. Uh, what the hell do I do? Uh, I'm a writer, a painter, uh, and I run a gallery, and I guess uh, under a wide hat, I could be called an art activist. You know, um, we've been running, I, I have a gallery here in Philadelphia named Rush Arts Philadelphia. We started Rush Arts in New York City in Chelsea uh, 25 years ago. So this is our 25th anniversary that we're celebrating this year. Um, so that's it, but right now, uh, well, a couple more days, I have a show up here in Philadelphia at In Liquid Gallery. Ah, I know uh, that well. It's a beautiful gallery. This is my first, oh, I think I had a piece in there for an auction or something, but I have a solo show there now with a catalog and a poster that they have. So, you know, you should get over there before Saturday before it closes, if you feel like trudging through Philly snow. <laughs> I have a, I have an in. So if I miss, I'll call Rachel and see if I can't sneak myself in afterwards. There you go, there you go. <laughs> Good. Who are you, Noah? <laughs> Yeah, stop being coy. I'm just some dude, man. I'm just some dude. <laughs> uh, uh, I'm Noah. I work with Ginger and with Danny. Um, we uh, Ginger and I have worked on several now uh, curatorial endeavors, um, and uh, I, it's been, I've been grateful to you know work alongside her and uh, participate with her. We worked recently on a mural arts project to. Put together a fellowship to support Black artists um, and uh, offer them a grant and some support services has been really wonderful. That's ongoing, and the new the new round of that is just starting up now. So uh, all of y'all that's listening, that are artists, if you need some support, uh, go on Mural Arts and apply for this fellowship. It's a couple racks, and uh, um, it's really meant to support artists of color. Uh, with Danny, um, we've been. Uh, hanging and banging for a while now, ever since I uh, helped to design his uh, solo exhibition of his art and his monumental collection of ephemera and African ritual objects, along with his own personal collection of contemporary art and his own work, which showed at the African American Museum in Philadelphia a couple years back. Um, ever since then, we've been uh, just going at it, putting together, you know, great exhibitions. Um, I've had the opportunity to curate his work into a couple of great galleries around the country. Um, and then um, just working with him with Rush Arts Philadelphia. I'm now the director there, which has been amazing. Um, and opening my own art gallery in uh, suburban Philadelphia, Upper Darby Art Gallery. Um, 
And I'm also the director of exhibitions and collections management at the Williams College Museum of Art in Massachusetts. And I, I just like to point out on, on behalf of Danny as a gallerist, as a fellow gallerist, that um, the act of having a black owned art gallery in and of itself for me is a form of activism. It, it really does require a certain strength and a certain sensibility toward the arts and toward the community. Uh, not the easiest endeavor, definitely, um, uh, you know, totally ice skating uphill. But um, um, I think in that regard, I'm also an artist and an activist as an artist. Um, I started out as a graffiti artist, which in, in my mind is a form of activism as well. Um, but I'll point to Danny's collection too, which he didn't really specifically mention as activism. But uh, uh, Ginger, you could speak to this as well, but you know, as, as collectors, I think also having uh, collections that's prim primarily a black art and with that as the focus is also a form of activism. I just, you know, yeah, this is, I'm all so excited. Um, we're here to talk about the intersection of arts and activism and, you know, kicking it off, when I think about it, Rush Arts, 25 years. First of all, congratulations. Thank you, thank um, you, thank you so much. But, you know, the topic that we chose was history doesn't have to repeat itself. So I guess my first question to you would be, when you started Rush 25 years ago, what need were you trying to fill? And tell me how that's changed up until now. Um, well, the need, uh, you know, I started this before Rush. Rush. Rush has been around for 25 years. But let's say doing what I'm doing that we do now at Rush has been 30 years. Um, and it started with me as an artist having a need. And I, I looked and took my, back then it was slides uh, to different galleries to drop them off. And in, in what was Soho before Chelsea even popped up and there were no galleries that had, that I saw in that area that had any black artists. Uh, and doing more research, I found out the lack of uh, exhibition opportunity for artists of color. So uh, the first thing I did was, uh, I gutted, I had a brownstone in bed and so I gutted out the ground floor to ground, brownstone and changed that whole thing into a gallery that I called the Sanctuary. And, uh, and basically invited Brooklyn artists and beyond to have a place where they felt like they were home. And so that's sort of been the theme of all the galleries ever since. Um, and there was a gallery in Tribeca named Annexed and then on to Rush, um, and then Corridor Gallery, finally, and now uh, uh, Rush Arts Philadelphia. Uh, but they all are, have been around the same theme of providing an exhibition space for emerging artists of color, artists who are outside of the mainstream, female artists. Uh, anybody who's not embraced by the mainstream is welcome to Rush. And so uh, in that way, it's, it's been an activist gallery. And we sort of launched the careers of a lot of, I'm not gonna go into a whole bunch of names, but most, most of the artists that are making the most noise now as black artists around the country and around the world uh, had early shows or be first shows at Rush or the Corridor Gallery in Brooklyn. So, but yeah, that's what started it. I ain't had no place to show. And actually Russell gave me the first place to show. The first place I ever showed was uh, even before Def Jam, he had a company called Rush Productions. And so me and our artist named Howard McCaleb, uh, he's a sculptor, we put up our, my first show there uh, in Russell's office. And then we did the annual Def Jam art show. And so Russell's part of this story too, as far as the activism of art, helping to facilitate the things that I saw we needed uh, mm -hmm. as people in the arts. Because I mean, it, it's not enough. To, it just you know, it's not enough to collect. Um, we really have to network and push, and provide these safe havens and these safe spaces. And I know that it feels like we keep saying it and we keep you know reiterating it. But it, just for people to understand, why do you think there's a real need for this? Like, what are the other galleries turning away? Like, why are they turning these artists away? Well, you know, in the beginning, and even now. In the beginning, uh, and still the gallery system and the museum system uh, is, is somewhat prejudiced towards white males. And so they, they, I don't know if it's direct racism or indirect racism, but they were not interested or the belief that the items wouldn't sell at the time 
that uh, except for a few people like Basquiat, and this, that, and the other, uh, that you know it it was worth their while doing. They didn't think it was economic. As as time changed and artists emerged from Rush and then the Studio Museum and were embraced by some galleries in the Main Street, black artists started getting more and more uh, traction in showing and and being represented by galleries outside of our community. And so when you look now and people start talking about the inclusion of black artists in the mainstream, you have to realize still that it's such a small, small percentage of us. And it's more than it's ever been, I believe. But mm -hmm. still, when you look at all the artists that I know, or you know, or no one knows, or our community knows, it's a very small percentage of artists that make it into mainstream white galleries. Uh, usually you have to have demonstrated that you're gonna make them some money before they'll take you on. And so, you know, I don't think very many galleries are nurturing artists from the ground up the way black galleries do. We look at some work and say, oh, I think our community would like to see that, would like to feel that. Maybe we'll sell some, we hope we'll sell some, but <laughs> our input is to push the artists our input is to educate the community to the arts. And I think that's different from the mainstream art world. Mainstream art world is about commerce. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that black galleries has always, not just Rush, but all black galleries have been, is part of being part of our community and bringing art to our community. So there's a different thing. So a whole different thing as far as cultural versus uh, economic impetus to do this thing. Yeah. Yeah, that's a, just a whole bag to, to unwrap. But it's just, it. I find it very um, daunting. Let me use that word. That we're still in the day and age where the, those things still ring true. Well, um, I mean, I no, was no, just no, gonna, I was just going to say, we're, it's not just the art world. It's, it's, it's the world, the, the environment in general. You know, um, we, as, 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 People need to nurture our community. Artists help build our communities. Having art gallery and community turns it around. Having art programs for children like we do turn it around. We've changed our mission largely to be, uh, it's, it's, we still do the same thing, but it's pointed at a different reason. This, our community, our mission is community upliftment through the arts. And so we're there for the community and we're bringing arts to the community. It's not just a place for artists to show their work you know, and emerge into our world is the place for artists to be a part of, to help heal and, and deliver culture into our communities. And so that's that's what we're doing. Um, and that's what Russia's mission. When I moved to Philadelphia, that, I moved with that mission in mind. And no, so, and like, think, no, no, ahead, sorry, sorry. Go ahead. no, I think that every community uh, needs some sort of cultural resource, a cultural center somewhere uh, planted down. And when we talk about activism, we're not necessarily talking about political activism, but we're also talking about cultural activism. So, you know, when we start talking about, well, did you make a, a Black Lives Matter poster or sign? That's part of our activism. But also part of our activism is just opening the doors and allowing people in who you know are not gonna buy anything, mm. but who don't know anything about art, uh, who are even afraid that they're not wanted in those spaces to encourage them to come into those spaces. So, you know, that's what our mission is about more, to bring these people in, because we know how important culture is to a community. And that community, if we support that community with culture, that community will come turn around and support us. And so it's a symbiotic thing that we got going on with the art community and with Logan, the neighborhood. I had said that to you when we spoke before that I thought it was a very interesting choice that you chose to put Rush Arts in Logan. And I, I say that because most of the galleries are downtown. Um, yeah. And so you've put one in a predominantly black neighborhood up. And I'm telling you, I said to you before on a street where I did not expect to, to find an arts gallery, it's refreshing. But could you just talk about why you chose that area? I mean, I think that it's good in itself that we are able to have things right outside of our door. I get frustrated with having to go so far in order to find cultural events or to find art in my own community. I have to, what, an hour downtown, but now I get to what drive 15 minutes down the block and I'm at your door. 
Right, and, and this, that's important. I, I wasn't looking for Logan. I was looking for a place like Logan. I didn't know Philadelphia. I had just gotten here. Uh, so the building dictated Logan. Uh, I was driving around. I had looked at several other places. You know, I was going to renovate something further down in North Philly. You know, I looked at about 20 buildings. And when I saw the bank, the, the bank annex that Logan was in, I said, this is perfect. Absolutely perfect. It's big. We got two stores. We got this, that, and the other. And I can afford it. That's the other thing. You know, being able to afford it. And then I took out a loan to renovate it. And we popped open. And we've been rolling ever since. And I think I picked the best person to run it who has a sensitivity for the community. I mean, Noah is able to be there and talk to people in the way that most gallerists, and he's so knowledgeable about the arts, you know, but he's also the person that can talk to these people in the community. Like he's, they're a part of him and he's a part of them and he has their interest in mind. He is not a gallerist in the traditional sense, this is a job. Noah also looks at this as a mission for the community. So, I mean, our partnership is amazing. I got that feel from him the first time Noah and I chatted. I had uh, invited him to speak with me for about 45 minutes on my own channel on Instagram mm -hmm. and immediately got that feel from him that he was invested in the community um, and invested in the artist in a very personal sense. And yeah. we just started working together because you need to have people who are on the same page, um, who have the same sort of like dedication if you're gonna push anything through. But that was gonna be my next question to you, Noah. Like, what are your experiences as being the director of the gallery? Oh man, um, Logan is an interesting case, you know? And I think that um, it's just one of those places that it's really rich in culture, it's really rich in art and, and creative energy. Um, I grew up as a graffiti artist in Philadelphia, in, in North Philadelphia, I'm from Fifth Street. So I recognize that the I, when I see this stuff is tagged up, I know that the creative juices is there, that the artists are there, that the creative energy is there. But what you see is a very kind of depressed, economically depressed, historically economically depressed area where, you know, the, the opportunities, period, for work, for, you know, enrichment seem limited. But they're there. There's a great library. There's a great community of people. There's great support services. There's Rush, right? But very much that, you know, the connections need to be made between the community and what all of these opportunities are in a way that it needs to happen, you know, often, you know, in a more concrete and direct way. We, we often have to go and meet our, you know, community constituents where they are. Like Danny said, not everybody is familiar with the experience of coming into an art gallery. Mm -hmm. Not everybody thinks when you open the door, you turn the lights on and there's beautiful paintings on the wall, or there's a poetry performance or a jazz performance, and it's free to the public. I've had, you know, brothers and sisters standing outside and just looking. And I invite them to, you know, you have to go outside and say, come on in. They say, no, 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 mm -hmm. I'm all right. I'm, I'm just looking. I just want to see what's going on. I say, no. This is for you. We open this up for you and you have to walk them in and give them a seat at the front of the house and really honor them in the way that is really deserving to them for having that interest, for putting themselves out there and showing up. Uh, I just recently, and may, many of y'all familiar with the story about the Painted Bride, who um, has gone through great lengths to try to move from the location they at because they felt like they started as more of a community service organization for the arts and that the community that they were in no longer reflected that. Right, right. right. So um, having this issue of the people who they're most wanting to serve, not feeling as comfortable traveling all the way downtown or in the old city in an area where they didn't necessarily feel welcome and that's where they had to meet their, you know, arts opportunity. So having a space in Logan, having a space where we can meet people where they are, where we can make this available to the individuals walking by on the way to the Logan uh, uh, Broad Street Line platform, or people that's, you know, tra traversing the neighborhood to go to work, kids coming from school. Um, this is really the power, the strength of it. And understanding that, you know, our constituents need, our, our audience, needs, you know, we, we have to understand that they're not necessarily coming to the same, coming to things from the same place. We're more of a model of what museums will provide in outreach and community engagement, right? 
which mm -hmm. museum model is not to make money. It's a nonprofit. They're going to basically zero out or lose money at the, at the end of every year to provide these, so, to be a hub of cultural and social services for the community. Most art galleries are there to make money as an investment in the artist that's coming in and a commodification of what they're doing and how can we get this out and break bread with the gallery. Our model as a private nonprofit has been vastly different and it very much more mirrors the model of museums in an effort to set ourselves up as a hub of social and cultural artistic services that we can have in the community and then be the kind of bridge and be the actual facilitator of having those things happen through us versus trying to make a dollar, right? And, and for us, the value really comes in, how can we build the local community just through this basic interaction of being present, having the doors open, making ourselves available for just doing what we do. And, and that's really been, you know, the work is just getting, you know, down out into the streets and talking to people. And that's really been the value. And, you know, we starting to see the community transform through the partnerships, through, you know, the, we, we're now redoing the front of the building with uh, our project that centers blackness and the movement for social change. Um, you know, we're a presence, we're a force, and I believe it's starting to take hold in the community. Yeah, yeah, I know we, we had like topics that we wanted to hit uh, on this hour. And I think the first one that I had uh, on my list was agents for change. And I think you really covered that um, to speak about what Rush is trying to do for the community and what a good model should be for the community and for the artist. Um, when I think about our title, history doesn't have to repeat itself. I just start like going back to um, maybe bigger institutions like back in the day, the Met in 69 with Harlem on my mind. Like we have these shows that are supposed to reflect our communities, but are done with little effort to, right? To actually use the people from the community in the show. And I think that that's really important. I love that about, about Rush. And I love that about this sort of new generation of uh, artists of color who are putting hands on, on those, but it still happens. I mean, I won't put any names out there, but we've had curators in major institutions that have curated shows and, you know, been unavailable for the, for the press time um, who've been put out of, like, Noah's smiling, you know what I'm talking about, but uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah. I just, I wonder um, what we could do to be different about that. I mean, I think that we're taking steps toward it. I know that you and I have been working on the fellowship and just trying to build a bigger network here in Philadelphia. It's not just about the grants that Mural Arts uh, is offering these artists, but also about us creating a network of uh, artists of color so that we can further ourselves, we can help ourselves, we can lift each other up um, and, and create more opportunities where we are part of the conversation. Let me put it like that. Um, and that we are hosting. Yeah, I think, I, I think, you know, professionally as someone who's worked a lot and currently working to try to, you know, bring diversity into museums and cultural institutions, I recognize how these processes take place and how artists can be eliminated from the conversation very easily. And most of it has to, you know, we say representation is important and we thinking about like seeing ourselves on the wall, you go to a museum and now frequently you see a giant Kehinde Wiley where before you might not see yourself at all in the museum. So, you know, we're very, you know, pleased when we see ourselves, but the representation have to really, um, come from the center of the institution. Mm -hmm. And it has to be in those committees that are selecting the artwork. It has to be in the committees that selecting the acquisitions. It has to be in the committees that selecting the exhibitions. It has to be in the advisory committees. So um, as you know, I, as my career has developed and I found my way into, you know, ever so slightly into these rooms, I see the power in that. And then in watching Danny's, you know, career as an arts administrator, uh, um, and I don't know if you if you would refer to your own career that way, Danny, but um, probably as, not. as a kind of a philanthropist, maybe in the arts. But I have he's no idea in those words. Words. But I I, I got you uh, involved, Negro. <laughs> <laughs> not how I would have said it, but yeah, okay. And you know what? I feel like I need but, to put that on a on a t shirt for Black History Month. <laughs> <laughs> right here, involved. <laughs> That, no, but Danny, can you speak to that? Because you're in those rooms and that's really, you know it, like I know that that's where the sausage is made and people can't see behind the door and mm -hmm. it's much different from what a lot of us would expect. And I would say it's a lot worse 
in a lot of cases. So it's so well, valuable listen, to have somebody with this perspective present. Right now we have something that's going on in the news about this museum who who was looking for a curator or uh. a curator. Uh, it says, yeah, that's willing to uh, hold on to our white core audience. Well, that, that, that. Shout out to Kelly. Shout out to Kelly uh, Morgan. Kelly Morgan for. Dr. He, Dr. Dr. Morgan. For that hit incident, but it's because of that attitude that Kelly left. And Kelly was uh, here with us for a while at PAFA, I believe, uh, working as a, a curatorial person. And I had a chance to have a talk with her at Rush, as a matter of fact. So, uh, you know, we, you remember that talk we had? But anyway. Uh, it started out, I mean, She's listen, I, one of the things that I think I was able to distinguish myself on, on in being involved is I didn't need them. I had my own gallery and I was making, doing this, that, and the other, wasn't asking these large institutions for money. And so they asked me early on to come sit at the table. Mm. Uh, and I said, okay. And so my first one was uh, the New York Foundation for the Arts, where we changed the geographic location of where money was being spent, you know, and there was a lot of art and not necessarily black, but just leveling the playing field was a big thing that I was involved in at, with, at NYFA. From there, I went to uh, the Brooklyn Academy of Music, which is one of the nation's premier uh, largest performing venues. And I did 15 years on the board there. And I, until I left to come to Philadelphia. I was on the board of the Brooklyn Museum. I was on the board of the Brooklyn Public Library. All these, and so many more, so many more. Hampton University, which is not the same thing. Long Island University uh, in the arts department. Uh, I've come here. I'm on PAFA's acquisition committee. I'm on the Philadelphia Museum of Arts, uh, African-American committee. I think that what Noah said is that we have to be in the room. We have, we, but it's not just skin color that has to be in the room because a lot of these institutions already had black people sitting in the room. Uh, they did not have black artists sitting in the room. Mm. They did not, they did not, they, and a lot of them were representing corporate interests. They were the black person they sent to the board meeting. Mm -hmm. um, uh, largely because a lot of these boards to be on cost 40 and $50,000. I don't know why they can't me. Maybe they thought I was valuable. But, <laughs> <laughs> but, but seriously, uh, with BAM, Russell paid them $15,000 $15, a year for many years for me to be on it because he knew the, um, you know, because I'm the artist in the family. I ain't got 15 grand. But anyway, <laughs> so I can help them. They need to pay me. But the deal is you need somebody who's thinking about the community in relationship to the institution. You need to have somebody who's thinking about the art, as an artist, you know, we changed the nature of what, it became, the Brooklyn Museum became a gallery that, uh, one of the first museums that was known to be centric to artists that were working instead of a, a repository of things of old. Under Arnold Lehman, who was the director, and the board of directors, we moved Brooklyn Museum into responding to the community in Brooklyn that they were around. And, and what about so, what time did that happen? Because I know you had kind of, I said to you, that's all I've ever known the Brooklyn Museum for. Um, um, early 2000s, maybe. Okay. I don't remember the exact year, but early to mid 2000s. Uh, I was on the Brooklyn Museum's board for five years, maybe. And uh, we did a lot of good stuff then. Um, and so, I, and, and I think that it's important that we have the perspective of the community, not black community, arts community, women, um, that activist women too, not just, you know, uh, because a lot of people sit there in body and, and are not really activists, are not really trying to speak for that. They're speaking for the museum in those capacities and not speaking for the community. Um, and so a lot of people are there to speak for the museum. And we, our, our job, I always thought, is to change, help change a museum or institution's direction to be more responsive to the people. You know, it, it has to serve the people. And if it doesn't, then it's really no interest of mine, uh, mm -hmm. unless I can get on there and try to push it to change. I think that the one thing that I hear a lot is that this seems, that, that type of role seems unattainable to people. 
So is there, is there a model or is there just a, a work ethic that you need in order to be in that position? You know, I didn't have, I didn't, I didn't push to be on any of these boards. They, they asked me, um, but what I, what I do think is that the people that are on the board now need to make space for people who can't afford to pay the buy-in to be on boards. You need people who are there that don't necessarily have jobs that allow them to pay $50,000 a year to sit on a board. You know, there, there are a lot of people, most people, <laughs> can't Y'all even hear that. It. Cultural institutions, are you listening? You know, yeah, but you know that's something board. they don't tell you. I know that you know. It, when I first came into the art world, being green, I had no idea that there you you had to pay money to sit on a board. It just felt like I'm gonna get on there. I'm gonna make a change, and then you're presented with this piece of paper, and it's just like, how much? Like, what, yeah, what will make you think it. I have this money? Um, and then they say, well, you can help us get it. But how many people do we know personally? that have $50,000 or $20,000. People, the great majority of the American public is struggling <laughs> to pay their bills, to get by, to make sure. They say most people, if they lost their job, would be homeless within six months. Right. Like that. So, you know, you don't have $50,000. So the people who do have that kind of money have a particular mindset because they do come from elite spaces. And so they don't really know or understand how important it has to be told to them, mm-hmm. how important it is that museums change to serve everybody in the final way. And they're doing that. I'm not saying this is not going on, this is, but it was going on so much less when I started this. It's going on now, the conversation in museums is exactly this. Now how it's executed is something else, but right. that's the conversation in museums. How do we serve communities and how do we serve people, artists uh, that we don't have, and how do we afford to buy their work to make sure our, our, our um, collections are representative of who American artists are. That's, so. that's very true. Um, I mean, I've noticed that some yeah. boards are now uh, sort of changing that buy-in factor to what skill do you have that we can use? Like we'll right. put the value in your skill, which, you know, for anybody listening, means that you need to be at the top of your game. You know, you, you need to be, yeah, we you need you to be twice as good. You have to be of value to, I mean, and I agree with that. You have to bring some value to the board. I guess mine was community mm-hmm. outreach, outreach to artists, this, that, and the other, blah, blah, blah. I guess that, I don't know what they saw to, to choose me, but you do need to have the people that bring value to the institution because it, it's a two-way street here. So, you know, people like Noah brings value. He knows collections. He knows hanging off. He knows how to engage communities. He's a perfect board member. Does he got 50 grand to give you? No. You can hire him for 50 grand to do the job. Now, but you understand what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. You, you have to look for people who can help you get from what your goal is to from what your mission is to your goal. And it doesn't necessarily always mean money. Right, right. One thing I'll say is the sincerity is always the key for me. I I have been placed on the board of a lot of smaller cultural institutions without being asked for board fees, specifically for the reason that they needed, they recognized that they needed to include uh, diverse voices and they recognized that that was gonna be an obstacle for them. And they overcame that. I think that's totally possible with larger cultural institutions too, but they have to be sincere about wanting to do that. A lot of these institutions are founded as rich kid clubs. You know, these are clubs that they trade wealth through art. You know, they they often are a very exclusive in their membership to the board. Um, often very, you know, at times it can be um, uh, restrictive, cost restrictive to even become a member to some of the cultural institutions. And, mm-hmm. you know, that in part is by design. You know, there are people that they don't want in there. And, and you know, this is what we have to disrupt. You know, this is what we're here to change and call out those cultural institutions with that mindset. Um, and, and we're saying, you know, we just finished talking about one of them that is, you know, they're chickens have come home to roost now, where they're going to have to prove to themselves, to, to, to their audience even, that they're sincere about, you know, creating a diverse space that's really speaking to all the initiatives that's present in the community and not just their own interests. They've failed to do that. 
They're being called out on it now. And now they're going to be pulled through this very difficult, tumultuous change as they try to undergo this under the public scrutiny, right? So, you know, be aware, cultural institutions, large cultural institutions, if your board is not diverse, if your, um, um, uh, your, your advisory committees lack diversity, if you're on an advisory committee and, and with a large cultural institution and you're looking around and you don't see any gay people and you don't see any black people and you don't see any people that English is not their first language and they maybe came from an international community, y'all are failing. And it will <laughs> happen to you the same way ultimately that it happened to Newfeld, uh, mm -hmm. you know, and maybe it won't take a Kelly Morgan to come in and kick your door open and have everybody see your dirty laundry, but it's coming. I'm coming for you, Danny's coming for you, and Jen. You know what, like, it's, it right. super, it's just like I, every other day, I love it that people are just like publishing the photos of all of the committee members. And it's like, what don't you see here? <laughs> you know, Boy. it's just, I just on Instagram every day. It's just, you know, and now everybody's getting to see what's behind the door. You know, like here's the wizard. Um, but well, I also that's think- That's what has to happen. Yeah, that's it has exactly to. What that, you know, if you're doing the right thing, it don't make no difference what they show you because <laughs> they show you the right thing. <laughs> you don't got shit to have. You know, so, but if we're know, changing right. it, if we're, if we're creating uh, this, this sort of like responsibility and this accountability, but for us to be ready to come in and take those spaces, you know, I think it's, it's, you know, fair enough to say you need to be ready. You need to have that vocabulary. You need to do your homework. You know, it's for everybody that I see that's ready for that job. There is someone else who wants to change the world, but has no knowledge of the history of black art. And I always say like, you mm -hmm. need to know what's going on in the market. Um, you need to go to an art show. I, and Danny, I, I agree with, I keep thinking to myself, like same people all the time, you know, you walk into Armory, I love seeing a Nick Cave. I love seeing Derek Adams. I love seeing Carrie Marshall. But it's just like, where is the fresh blood? Like, where, where's the new? Um, but in Derek's order- kind of new. Yeah. Yeah, Derek's of that new generation, but there are newer, younger artists coming out that, you know, but we have to push for them. And, well, even a bigger problem is going into their system. We need to support seeing them when they're still at our institution. Mm -hmm. You know, um, and one of the things that I always been a pet peeve of me is once people have made it, very few artists come back and fetch it, mm -hmm. as Sankofa says. Very few of the top artists continue to come back to the galleries they started at. And so a form of activism is just showing up and saying, I, I, I showed here because that encourages the next generation and right. encourages our institutions to get grants and this and that and the other. When you, when you talk about where you came from and what a job they do to get you ready for being anywhere out in the big world or whatever that fuck that is. But if you understand what I'm saying, you need, we need to come back and support our own. And so one of the things that I've seen over the years is, is artists making it and scoffing at even putting one piece back in the show in, in the neighborhood or coming back to the neighborhood to support the gallery in the neighborhood mm -hmm. because you know they're beyond that now. And they think that their, their life and their, 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 their careers are tied up in Chelsea, but their life started somewhere else. Is and it just them or do back. you think there's pressure from their new galleries, these big galleries and that representation to not go back? Oh, I, I don't know. I've never been part of the real gallery scene. Uh, I've been an artist of somewhat of some note, but not through the gallery scene, just being an artist. But um, a lot of a lot of them support. And I'm not saying, but I don't think there's pressure for them not to. I think that it's not in there. I think people are selfish for the most part. And so it's not really in their interest. They don't see it as being part of their interest. How does that help them? How does that further them to do that? I could be doing something for me in this time space, not realizing that doing something for the community is doing something for you. You know, I don't think it's any outside pressure. I think it's an inside look that they have to do and see the value in coming back and understanding what's involved in making a strong, arts community in our community. And these big artists coming back to these galleries that are in the neighborhood would help to do that. Yeah, I agree. I, 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 I would agree. agree with that. I would agree with that. And also I'll just add that I think um, 
there is, uh, it, like I've seen this at Rush where, you know, we get, you know, donations as a part of our fundraisers and please do check out Rush's auctions when you see them and the availability online, you have to purchase artwork through us. They are huge opportunities because a lot of our artists have come back and have supported and it, and it has been great, but it can, it can be trying. I think there's two different veins of art galleries. And we were talking about that before, where there's one that's kind of more of a model where the art is commodified. And there's one where there's more of a model where it's more of a community building exercise. And I think when an artist gets bigger and they start to deal with more and more of the kind of commodified galleries, they start to see galleries that way and lose the connection you know, to the galleries that are not there just to make money and the ones that they may really need to support. Those galleries are often smaller. They don't make as much noise. They're easily forgotten. Is that place even still open? They're still languishing, serving you know, the small art class and teaching kids and serving the community like they always have. But because you know, they might not be able to make as much noise as a bigger gallery that's pumping out brochures every month, then um, you know, it can go by the wayside. And I think it, it really does take us looking carefully and seeing which galleries are there to build a community and worthy of support. And for the rest of the art community around that to elevate those spaces and recognize when this is an a, a act of activism or you know, an act of community service more than an act of you know, capitalism or commercialism to our art that um, there's the opportunities for artists to really give back where it can really be impactful. And it's not about them making money or the gallery, you know, enriching themselves. And I think those um, opportunities exist through galleries like Rush, but I think they're few and far between because galleries like Rush are rare. And, mm -hmm. and you know, the, the, the places that are sincere in their dealings with art and artists and communities are rare and it's becoming less rare, but at the moment, it's still an oddity, you know, that, that um, we're about what we're about and we're as present as we are and as relevant as we are. But, you know, we're hoping that this activist action of continuing to be present will change that. Yeah, I mean, you're even doing- this conversation, you, even this yeah. conversation may change that. In this conversation, Ginger. I yeah, hope so, I, I really do. Um, we're gonna start running into our Q&A soon. So I just wanna let everybody know if you have any questions for us, please put it in the chat or in the Q&A. Um, but I tell you, you must be doing something right because I have, for the past three years, run into people who have worked with you uh, at Rush Arts and in New York at a fair, and they find out you're from Philly, and it's like, have you been over to Rush? <laughs> and it's just like, no, no, I haven't been there. Why haven't you been there? Why aren't you there? This is what they're doing for the community, and that's how I became aware that you were even in Philadelphia. It was just by you know running into someone at a fair in New York. Um, it's you know it's one of those things, but. Well, we like I okay. said, Noah and I are a great team and we've been working it. Yeah, yeah. And if anybody, um, please, if you if you have the opportunity, I know with the well, pandemic, it's hard to- Let me just add, right now about Visioning Rush, before we go any further. Yes, please. That Rush is, I want to say this with pride because we work really hard to make this a reality. Rush is back open. We are open for appointments. We're open for business on Saturday. You have to make an appointment to come see the in-person show. But we have the best in-person show up. Uh, wonderful artist, Anthony Carlos Molden. The show yep. is absolutely nice. mind-blowing, okay? It's selling out right now. So if you can visit it online and try to check out what you want, do it now because it's going quick. But there is opportunities um, for the next month or so. Uh, we, are, we were just talking to Danny and I today about extending this show. Or, or what we were going to do because it's, it's it's been so popular to finally get reopened and had this wonderful show. But uh, come check out if you get the opportunity uh, right away while while the appointment times last to see Anthony Carlos Molden's exhibition uh, typographies and synopses while it's up and running at Rush Arts Philadelphia. I was just about to say that people should come down, but I wasn't sure if you were open. I'm like scrolling through my Instagram because Anthony sent me a link. I'm going to see if I can put that link up in our chat for his show um, as well. Yeah. But it's let a brilliant me, show. It, he keeps, yeah, he's been binging we're me about it. We're very proud of it. And I'm so excited to try and get down there and see it. But I'm gonna see if Victoria, if I don't, if I can't find it, I know I, I think I gave it to you so that we could pop it in the chat, but I'm gonna keep looking for it while we're talking. I'm gonna start jumping into some of these um, Q and A's because I feel like we're gonna get more than we have time for. So I'll get started. 
Uh oh. We have one from Niel. Why do you believe Black artists are automatically labeled as activists? That's interesting. You got to unmute, man. I don't know how that happened. I didn't touch it. Who's that, <laughs> who's that question for? Anybody who wants to answer it. I don't think Black artists are automatically, are they automatically, um, you know, tagged as activists? I, I didn't know that. Uh, I don't, unless the art itself is the, is the subject of activism or political, I don't think the, that artists are activists by the nature of creating art. I think they can be activists in their behavior. I think their art can be activists, but I don't think it's an automatic thing. There are so many Black artists who don't create work related to struggle or, 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 or a historical past that, that exposes injustices or, or promotes any point of view. So, I mean, they're not activists, but uh, you know, I think that you can create art that can be activism. You can create art that's not activism, but be an activist yourself by, by supporting communities or working with people in the community. But the art itself doesn't have to be. Or neither does the artist. Any yeah, thoughts on I think, that, Noah? I feel. I think that uh, it depends on who you're asking, who's label, who's doing the labeling. I think Danny and I don't label black artists as activists. I don't think you do, Ginger. But I think when we're talking about the art world, we're mostly talking about you know a non-other world, right? And often the other comes in and is labeled as you know speaking for all of the others. Right. And, and often when they reach out for one of us others, like myself or like Niel or like Anthony Carlos Molden or any of the artists that we work with, um, they're looking for activism. They're looking to get the voice of the community through the artists. And that may or may not be what the artist does. A lot of artists are abstractionists, you know, and this is why we, we've been talking lately. We have another um, virtual exhibition up uh, called Black Abstraction curated by Dawn Stringer, that the idea is that, you know, we don't always have to be activists. And sometimes just, you, you know, um, it, it's a value for us to just be realized just for our artwork by itself and not ever, you know, personal or socio-political message that we bring it forward. But I do feel like, you know, when you're, when, you know, if, if you're in a museum and, and there's no people of color or there's very few and one comes in, then you're looking at them to represent, you know, and that's where I think it starts. It, it starts with uh, the lack of diversity. You know, if you have more diverse voices in that room, then the perspective ever so subtly changes and people start to get looked at as people. Right. You know, people are looking for black art to be black. That's what, <laughs> that's what this boils down to, especially the outside world. They, well, what, what, what is this? this? This don't look black, this don't say black to me. Uh, and so, yeah. w which is why we've always had a, uh, uh, the art world has always had a preference for black figurative art because they could see the black in it, especially mm. if we were representing black people. Uh, and it's just now that black abstractionists are starting to get uh, the recognition that they deserve. So, I mean, with anything else, black is fetishized in this country and in this in this society. So, you know, they, they want to see the black in it because that's what they do. And they want to see the black football players, they want to see the black, 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 black baseball players and basketball players and entertainers. And they want to see the black artists. Mm -hmm. and, and when you step outside of that, you know, uh, sometimes it's harder to get recognized. Yeah. I've had that experience at art fairs, you know, a selling for a gallery and then having a collector walk in and then they just, Who's black in this booth? I'll buy them. It's like, do you do you want to look at it? Do you? <laughs> that's how you want to purchase it. You know, it's hard to. Oh goodness, it's hard to want to sell to anybody um, who takes that sort of pace with with art. But we have um, another question on how do we build art communities while making sure that artists and specifically black artists can eat, pay rent, and thrive. Mm. No, you want to hit that one challenge. Part? <laughs> Why you want to hit me with the hardest question of how artists can eat and be, make art at the same time? I don't think anybody has figured that one out yet exactly. No, um, 
Uh, I think that's the case. So for I grew up. I was just gonna say I think for that's most, the case of, for most emerging artists, right? Like for just for just working artists in general, yeah. Yeah, I mean, yeah. you know, I, I don't mean, think that's specific to black artists. We might have a harder time, just like we have a harder time in anything else. But go, no, I didn't mean to cut you off. No, I was raised by starving artists, so you know, I was raised by a black oil painter in North Philadelphia. And it was real. I mean, it's, it's a choice constantly. It's like, are you going to really pursue this art thing and damn near starve? Or are you going to go out and do, you know, all the other things that society tells you you need to be doing? So I think um, it's difficult. Um, we don't, you know, the reason, I think one of the reasons why there's not more like, you know, classically trained um, artists of color and more people don't come through that vein is the same reason why it's not more, you know, of any kind of highly educated, you know, really expensively educated um, people of color or other people in those veins is because, you know, we're cut off in a lot of cases by, you know, different, you know, societal, you know, issues that don't, we don't necessarily, we're not necessarily afforded the same opportunities, you know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. So, well, um, I, think, I, wasn't um, encouraged, it's, it's, I wasn't encouraged to be an artist for that same reason. Me neither. Me neither. I was raised by two artists, and my parents were like, "What you gonna have to fall back on?" <laughs> was like the main thing, you know. But I think um, the the truth is that what I've seen now is that the cultural arts and museums and art galleries have become their own kind of economy, and that there is work. You know, if you want to find workers, I, I I spent years working in museums as an art handler, as a preparator, at, you know, as somebody who. Um, who recover galleries, who shipped artwork until I got to the place where I could support myself and try to work in those other veins on my own. I think to really be an artist, you really have to immerse yourself and how to find that balance, you know, mm -hmm. of, uh, you know, what I consider kind of often very selfish act of putting all the other things in your life aside and just focusing on your artwork. It's not easy. And there's a lot of things in society that's gonna pull us away from that. But right. if it's real with artists and they really sincere, I think they persevere over time and continue to work on their craft and whatever time you do not give up, eventually you find the exposure, you find the success. It, it, you know, we're seeing a lot of black artists now whose work, whose greatness is just being realized in their seventies and their eighties. You know what I'm saying? It's sad, but you know, it, it should give hope to those that are, you know, laboring in obscurity. What was the name of that documentary that oversimplified uh, black art recently? What was it called? In the Absence of Light? Yeah, um, and black, I think that's black what artists in the absence of like something like that. I watched it. It was a good documentary. I ain't had no beef with it. It was sad, yeah. but yeah. You know, it was like I had a little, I had a little something wrong with it. But I mean, to to, <laughs> <laughs> to just put my two cents in, Sophia, because this is who asked the question. Um, I think that it is about networking, and I know that's hard to do within the pandemic to find you know like-minded people to build a community with. But as far as eating, paying rent and thriving, yeah, we've, we've been through, that's hard for everybody. But I think that the one thing that I enjoy about a community is when you can barter, when I don't have to pay for certain services because I'm networking within. Um, and I think it's really important if you, if you have friends and you start building that community, start looking at helping one another. Can he do your artist statement and maybe you do his photographs? Can, you know, if you're, if you're sharing your services, then you're not putting out the money. Right, and it's it's a way for you all to sort of sharpen yourselves, and for you just to to help out in, in the way a community is supposed to. So I find that a lot of people don't think about that or don't think that that's worth anything to actually you know exchange services. But it's a great use, um, and I'm trying to try and get to to all of these. We have one that was bartering. in the past. Yeah, thank you. The bartering. I mean, it's something they used to do all the time, and I think that some people just don't want to do it. They think about cash in their hand, but that is money. <laughs> like, that is money, money well, you well, don't have to foul. In working with Danny's collection and, and even my own, um, I've seen a lot of you know bartering and trades between artists, between cultural institutions, you know. This is the model from that comes down from museums is, um, especially academic um, art museum is trading loans, trading exhibits and borrowing each other's stuff and the process that goes into that. And, um, you know, that's a model that artists can use. It, it is a community thing. And when you are in a network and a community of artists and, you know, some even something as simple as somebody could eat over somebody else's house or crash on somebody's couch from time Very to time true. can be huge. But sharing art spaces, sharing materials, 
bartering, you know, um, but being industrious and ingenuitive as black people is our nature. And, you know, the, the, the greatness finds its way. So we have two more, I'm gonna try and jump to them. I know we're gonna go a little over, but um, this one is pretty lengthy. As folks who are trying to increase representation and community engagement with the arts and museums, do you see any role for community scientists and scientific institutions to come together with artists to help expand the community's comfort and stake in these historically white spaces? Absolutely. So one thing that's interesting is as in academic institutions, which is kind of the foundation of the art museum, is that they collect certain data fields about artwork. They don't collect everything. They collect like where the artist was from, kind of where they, you know, they, they, the mediums, the, the genre of art, they don't collect much. But as we look at art differently and we try to expand the view on art and look at different types of art, like new media art and looking at sculptural art in different ways through the lens of virtual reality, where, you know, you have to engage with a sculpture that, you know, you, you can't really look at it in a, two, in a two dimension. We start to see other ways to look at art and other data fields around the art to include, right? So this gives us an opportunity to look at, let's say, a sculpture that's made out of stone through a scientific lens. What if we examine that sculpture stone and by microscope with geologists and understood more about where those materials came from and how they were milled, right? Um, what if we gave people other, other um, 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 sciences opportunities to do testing on these objects to make visual representation of those testings of that information of that data, as well as um, giving writers and poets the opportunity to respond, giving all kinds of, you know, different um, intellects, the opportunity and, and um, uh, you know, all of the thinkers of our world, the opportunity to really engage with these individual pieces of artwork, and then finding ways to express that data visually, put it in an exhibition. So instead of looking at a, a room full of objects, look at one object from different angles, like the angle of a scientist, like the angle of interpretive dance, like the angle of a poet, you know, and see what comes out of that. And I think there, there's ways to really richly expand the ways we've looked at these static collections mm -hmm. that have, you know, been residing in art museums for hundreds of years. And it makes opportunities for all of these different, you know, um, brilliant, you know, minds to come into the conversation and really, you know, blow it up. Um, you know, we see, we, we've just seen and we're living through an opportunity to expand how we use science and technology to promote the arts. I mean, we wouldn't have thought of virtual gallery shows unless okay. the pandemic hit. We wouldn't have thought of teaching kids all over the nation now uh, virtually through this vehicle, Zoom, unless the pandemic hit. So I think, you know, we're finding out now ways that we can use technology to give greater exposure to artists uh, than we could just sitting inside a gallery. You know, we'd be like real hype when a hundred people come to a gallery show, you know, oh God, we had a hundred people in the room, blah, blah, blah. Now we can have thousands of people in the room, you know, mm -hmm. and that's amazing. You know, we did deaf poetry which uh, at, at uh, the Brooklyn Museum, uh, not the Brooklyn Museum, uh, Philadelphia Museum of Art, we had 700 people in the room, but we reached about 10,000 people online. So, you know, that's science, that's technology. Uh, but what comes to my mind, I kept on thinking about the show that Noah worked on that's now at ICA, the Milford Graves show, where he looked at, Milford Graves was a musician who created music based on his heartbeat that also created visual artwork. Mm. So this is the melding of music, visual arts and science into one cohesive, uh, from what I understand, extraordinary exhibition that's right now at ICA uh, Institute here in Philadelphia. So, I mean, there are different ways to do it, but I, I think the greatest thing that we've we've come up on now is the, uh, the use of science and technology to expand our audience and expand our reach with the message that we have as artists. Oh, that's great. And you're welcome, Sarah. We have everybody saying thank you for answering these questions um, so thoughtfully. We have one last question, and I think that's gonna hit us at time. 
Um, creating a space that puts cultural exchange first is a beautiful thing, but we were wondering how people outside of the Logan community can support your work. Um, so many resources for nonprofits, but rarely for galleries with great missions. Yeah, okay, so there we Give go. Give us some money. How we can we support money. us? We, we, need, we need money, um, but, <laughs> <laughs> but you um, know what? Um, I'm, I'm sure there's support <laughs> on social media as well. And the person asking this question is a really lovely curator here in Philadelphia. So yes, um, Ryan, <laughs> you, you can also you know come down, check this out. And people really listen and respond to what you say in the city. So I'm sure we could also use you just giving it a shout out on social media as well. But like Danny says, but money's great too. Money's great. Well, listen, just expanding our reach. You know, uh, we, we reach some communities. We don't reach a lot of different communities. Everybody has different reaches. Help promote us and let people know what we're doing is, is really paramount. You know, we had just a very successful fundraiser that was all, you know, uh, online and it's through outreach that we were able to, to raise enough money to exist for another year. You know, artists donated, people donated, and we sold a lot of art and on on uh, artsy and we did we did a lot of great things. So this is through our reach. And so anytime somebody is able to expand our reach, talk about our mission, and talk about you know what we're doing, and then refer people once the gallery now that it is open again. Go see the show, go visit the gallery, see what we put in the middle of a neighborhood that people would, would have never expected to be in that neighborhood, you know? So I think we're doing well. And I think Noah's doing the fantastic job and his team and we're just pushing forward. Right now I'm in the process of building, I came to Philadelphia with a very celebrity centered, New York centered uh, board of directors. And I am now changing that over to a really Philadelphia centric board of directors that really will work because they understand the mission in Philly. You know, our big thing was the big thing in the Hamptons and this, that, and the other. We are a very different organization here in Philadelphia than we were in New York. And so I'm trying to adapt our organization to run on a Philly sort of, Philly supports rush. And we manage that really well the last fundraiser because we've raised enough money to exist for another year without exactly. like, oh, oh my God, how are we gonna do this? Right. Um, and it was through outreach and great people. And some of those people that were on the committee are now board members. As of today, as a matter of fact, we voted them in and we have four new board members. I'm not gonna announce it on this show, but, and we're looking at another person, a Philadelphia artist that's well known, whose reach would help us. And so we're, we're really making this about we're going to change. The, we're going to try to change the dynamic of how and where art is viewed in Philadelphia. And I think you know we're we're going to try and uh, end the show unless Noah has something else to say on that note. But we put three really important links in the chat, so I'm going to give everybody an opportunity to grab those. Um, earlier, we talked about uh, Anthony Molden's show at Rush. We have a link there for you to to pop in for that. We also have a link for you to donate to Rush a great way of supporting the gallery and a little further up in the chat if you go up you'll find a link to apply for the philadelphia fellowship for black artists um, that's being hosted through mural arts so please check out all of those and i just want to thank uh danny simmons and noah for coming on um look forward to working with you and seeing you guys outside of the virtual space as well but thank right, you Jenna. so much for dropping all of this knowledge today i really appreciate it we appreciate you having us. Thank you. Talk to you later. Thank you, Jenny. Give me a call right. later, Noah. Let's let's have right, our man. our music. Yeah. Play us out. <laughs> you got the neo soul on now. <laughs> You're supposed to be gone.